In chemistry, phase changes are a huge part of the course. Melting point, boiling point, solid, liquid, gases, and the properties. One substance that's rather remarkable is this right here, solid CO2, known as dry ice, because it does that. It goes directly from a solid to a gas. It sublimes. Why exactly does dry ice do that? Why does regular ice not? Regular ice goes from a solid to a liquid, then a gas. It melts and then boils. Well, we're going to talk about that. In order to really understand that, we're going to save this piece of dry ice too. We're going to uh, talk a bit about phase diagrams. So, what is a phase diagram? It's actually a map more than a graph, with the coordinates being pressure, usually we'll talk about those in atmospheres, versus temperature, and I'll use degrees Celsius here. We're going to start with a phase diagram of a substance we're much more familiar with, good old H2O. One atmosphere, which we'll put right about here in the middle of our graph, map, phase diagram, that's the pressure we're most familiar with. You know, we experience a whole range of different temperatures on this planet, but not very much in the way of different pressures. We pretty much live our whole lives at one atmosphere. High pressure fronts, low pressure fronts, change that by only a few percentages. If we had a chunk of H2O, that's a chunk, if we had a sample of H2O at one atmosphere, and we'll start at, let's say, negative 10 degrees Celsius, what would be the most stable phase? Well, obviously solid. So I'm going to start with a solid line, and if I increase the temperature, which is going to the right on this map, it would remain a solid until we get to a certain point. We call it the melting point. As it turns out, that's a bit of a misnomer. It's really a line. We'll get to that. At that point, it changes from a solid into a liquid. So there's my little liquid line, <laughs> little wavy, watery line there. And that would continue, that's at zero degrees Celsius. That would continue until you got to about 100 degrees Celsius. And from there, at that point, we call it the boiling point, also a misnomer, it changes to a gas. And now I have to draw the little gaseous line. And that really is our entire view of good old H2O, solid, liquid to gas, at those transition points. The reason we see it that way, though, is because we have our eyes closed to this narrow little slit that represents one atmosphere. The whole point of phase diagrams is to open our eyes to the whole picture. What happens at different pressures to these transition points? Well, if I went to a lower pressure, let's say around 0.1 atmospheres, and this is not going to be a linear type axis here, it would go from a solid to a liquid at pretty much the same temperature, around a zero. Actually, a little bit higher, but you'd swear this is a straight up and down line. I'm going to exaggerate it by making it a little bit more this way, but it's like 0.1 degrees or 0.01. The real change, though, is in the liquid to the gas, which takes place at a much lower temperature. That's why water on the top of a mountain will boil at a much lower temperature. And they have different cooking instructions at high altitudes for that very reason. We're really interested in this, how this transition point changes, and that's why it becomes a melting line and a boiling line. And it shows us that this pattern continues. The liquid exists over a much narrower range of temperatures at this low pressure. That implies that if we got to a low enough pressure, I believe it's actually 0.06 atmospheres, you would actually have a transition from a solid to liquid, to gas, all at the same time. Boiling ice water, wouldn't that be cool to see? Well, we're going to see that in a second. Below that, you have only the solid to gaseous transition. So this line, which is kind of a unison of these two lines, is called the sublimation line. Melting line, boiling line, sublimation line. Of course, that's crossing over at this direction. If I cross over the other direction, it's the freezing line, the condensation line, and the deposition line. That's the opposite of subliming. And this pattern continues going up. There's nothing special about one atmosphere. These are continuous. And this is what a phase diagram looks like, a kind of a big Y, with that point right there being the triple point.
So what's this have to do with dry ice and why it sublimes? Well, I'm going to draw for you the phase diagram for CO2. It looks remarkably similar. Solid liquid gas, a big old Y, triple point. One noticeable difference, this solid liquid line tilts a little bit to the right instead of to the left, but that's because I've exaggerated the scale. If I had, these would be essentially vertical lines. But one thing that's most different about this, and it has to do with the intermolecular forces between nonpolar molecules like CO2 versus very polar ones like water, and that is where the triple point, I mean, so where the uh, one atmosphere falls on this, on this chart. For H2O, it's here, but for CO2, it's way down here. And that's why at one atmosphere, our vision of CO2, solid, directly to gas. Sublimation is all we ever see. That's again because we have our eyes closed to this narrow slit. Does liquid CO2 exist? Certainly, right here. But what would that mean in terms of actually being able to see liquid CO2? Well, that would mean we'd have to get to a higher pressure. Remember, this is the pressure axis. This is the temperature one. By the way, this temperature, a bone chilling negative 78 degrees Celsius. How high would I have to get the pressure? Up to about 5.1 atmospheres. Some books say 5.2, 5.1. No one really seems to know. And I believe this is negative 56 degrees Celsius. That's the triple point. I have to be at or above the triple point if I want to witness liquid CO2. Well, I want to witness it, and I'm going to. That chunk of dry ice that I rescued from the water before will be plenty for this demonstration. Okay? How can I make that piece of dry ice melt instead of just sublime? I have to increase the pressure. Well, I could try to seal off the the doors and stuff and start turning on a bunch of air compressors and build pressure in this room, but that, that wouldn't work. So instead, I'm going to use a little plastic pipette, five cents worth of material for a million dollar observation. We have to cut off the top of this pipette. Okay, all we're really interested in is this part of it here, and that's going to give me a chance to get the dry ice in there. So I'm going to put some of the dry ice, I'm going to break this up first into a powder, put some of the dry ice in there, and then I'm going to clamp this off. You might think I have to connect this to some kind of air compressor to build up, but I don't have to. As long as I clamp this off and that dry ice continues to sublime, as it's going to do according to the phase diagram, it'll build up its own pressure. I won't be able to clamp it off with just my fingers, though. I guarantee you, five atmospheres is quite a bit. In fact, even these pliers across the top would make for a difficult seal I'm going to, after I put the dry ice in there, take this metal rod and metal bar. Maybe we can zoom in on that. The bar is flat, the rod is round, and if I slip this around it like that, and then clamp down with the pliers like this, right on top. I know you can't see that juncture right now, but what I'm doing is I'm squeezing that rod against the bar, and because they meet at a line, that's going to give me a very nice tight seal. Two rods wouldn't work. They'd slip by each other. Two bars would still be flat against flat. You want a bar and a rod, and that's why that works. Okay? When we do that, we'll see the dry ice. Well, we won't see anything. You know why? Because it's going to get so frosted over with all the humidity in the room, you won't be able to see anything. Not only that, but that plastic tends to get pretty brittle when it gets so cold down to negative 58, negative 50, uh, 56 degrees Celsius. And if it gets cold and brittle, it can behave like glass. So if it ruptures, and it will rupture, it would be like little glass shards flying over and a very loud noise. So this sounds very dangerous, except for one thing. I'm going to use a cup of water. And that cup of water is going to serve many purposes. One thing, as soon as I clamp it off, I'm going to lower it into that cup of water. That water is going to remove the condensation that forms give me a nice clear view. It'll actually give me a magnified view. Can you see how much bigger it looks underwater than it does out here? Okay. The water is also going to act as a heat sink. It's going to make it happen a little faster, but it's also going to keep the bulb nice and supple, soft. And perhaps best of all, um, I'm going to actually move this over here. <laughs> it's going to give me a lively splash rather than a loud noise. 
And when I mean lively, I mean like hit the ceiling lively splash. It's just water. But still, good to know that ahead of time. Um, so here we go. I'm going to take this piece of dry ice, and I like to just put on a cloth like this, fold over the cloth, and break it up like that. It doesn't go anywhere. I haven't touched it. And now I get this nice powder. It's very brittle stuff. And you don't touch it. You just kind of scoop and tap, scoop and tap. I got some big pieces still there, and that's okay. And you want to put enough in there to fill the bulb about halfway. Okay? Very few people have had a chance to actually witness CO2 in the liquid state. It's hard to see. I'm going to cover this up to keep it uh, ready for the next time. And now, again, here's my little rod and bar across there, the pliers. And we're going to want to kind of get a nice close-up of what goes on. You can see how the condensation is already starting to block the view of it. But as soon as I put it in there, we get a nice clear view. I'm going to put it on the bottom just to uh, help me keep it steady. And right now the pressure is building up in there. Whoop. And uh, if it were leaking, I'd probably hear a little noise, but I'm not, so I'm pretty sure it's working. And there it goes. See it start to melt? At this point, I'm going to release the pressure a little bit. And you see it come back into a solid little piece of it just flowed up there. There's the triple point. There's back into the solid gaseous combination. So I can kind of fine tune where I'm on that phase diagram moving up and down. I'm clamping off again now. And it takes a little bit longer because there's less of it there to build up the pressure each time. If I don't release the pressure, here's what happens. As I said, a rather lively splash. The <laughs> pipette was, had a seal blown open in the side of it there. And uh, so, nice little demonstration of, of that. Is it possible to actually quantify this and get a, an experimental value for that 5.1 atmospheres? Well, that's what I'm going to show you now with this, OK? For this purpose, I need a little bit larger a pipette just because I'm going to be slipping a little micro pressure gauge in there. And you can get a close up on this maybe. I've taken a thin stem pipette, cut off just the, the stem of it, put some hot melt glue in one end and attached a little thread. And this is a little crossbar there that's going to keep it from sliding in too far. And then, now this end down here is open. That's important to know. I incremented it. You could use any increments you want. These are half centimeters. So zeros here, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 15. It goes to about 20 increments. OK? This is my little micro pressure gauge. But it needs some kind of a needle to read on this. I took another thin stem pipette. You can pull out the thin stem to make it even thinner. So it fits inside here. And this is just some water with some blue food coloring. And I'm going to put a little drop of that blue food coloring right about there. OK? And now, I don't know if you can see that or not, as a reading, I'm reading 15, 16, 17, 18, 19.2, we'll say. So we're going to write that down at one atmosphere. You can just put down up there on the board, 19.2, we need a unit, we'll call them becaliters, okay? 19.2 becaliters on my micro pressure gauge, okay? Now, that's not going anywhere because the pressure's not changing in this room. Um, I've got my pipette here. Did I cut off the, oh, here it is. Um, that's big enough? Sure. Let me just check that height differential. You know what? I want a little bit more of, okay. My dry ice, again, I'm not handling the dry ice. I'm just scooping up some. Let me break up a little bit more. What I'm going to do now is slip that little gauge down inside the neck of this pipette. And when I clamp it off, because that little drop of water 
has essentially trapped a little air pocket behind it. We'll see that air pocket get compressed. Now that's not even half a bulb, that'll be plenty for this, okay? So here it is, because that air pocket's gonna get compressed, we're gonna actually see the pressure change. So I'm gonna drop this in here, and notice something. That little T-bar is keeping it from dropping down too far, okay? And now the rod and bar assembly. Okay. I'm clamping down on the thread, not on the gauge itself. You don't want to clamp down on the gauge. The top of the gauge is right there, and I'm not sure if you'll be able to focus on that or not, but you'll have to take my word for it otherwise. You can zoom in on that drop climbing, because as soon as I clamp this off, it's going to start to climb. So I'm going to clamp it off now, and watch that little droplet of water. So I clamp it off, it's climbing. It's climbing because this, this air pocket is getting compressed. And now I'm kind of watching two things. I'm watching down here to see when it starts to liquefy, and I'm also watching when that drop starts to hover. It's right now climbed all the way up to five. Past, there's a five mark. It'll hover there, there's a little pressure plateau, just like there's a temperature plateau at that phase change. Now I'm at one, two, three. It's hovering at around 3.1, uh, more like 3.2. I've got liquid down here, so I'm going to release the pressure. And you saw it hover again there. Okay, I'm going to do it again. I can increase the pressure. You see the drop climbing? There is at six. Passing up the five mark. There is at four. Is that showing up okay on the screen? I'm kind of having trouble holding it steady. It's at about 3.3 again. It's hovering there. I have some time. I'm seeing the liquid start to form down here. You can sp span down there if you want. And then I'm going to release it. And again, it hovered there for a second. So 3.2. And how do we solve this then to figure out what that pressure would be? Well, it's actually very simple. The equation we're going to use is simply P1 V1 equals P2 V2. Good old Boyle's Law. Our initial pressure, when I first put that drop in there and trapped the column of air, was one atmosphere. And the initial volume that I trapped in there was 19, what was it? 19.2 beciliters. BLs. What was the pressure at which it hovered? We don't know. We'll call that P2. But the volume at which it hovered, at which it reached that triple point, was 3.2 beciliters. This is going to be a little bit high, I can tell, because 19.2 divided by 3.2 is around 6 instead of 5.1. We get about 5.9? 6. 6 even? OK. So we got fairly close results. Um, the taller you make that stem, the more precisely you can make those measurements. But uh, it gives you a good approximate value for that pressure. We got something between 4 and 10 or so. So phase diagrams, they really do give you the complete picture. You can approach this as a very simple lab, just, hey, let's see what liquid CO2 looks like. Or you can take it a step further and treat it quantitatively and get some values that you can uh, do some air analysis on. Uh, Phase diagrams are certainly worth inclusion in any chemistry curriculum. Thank you.